So sustainability and ESG in today's world. Sustainability is a really broad umbrella that really means what, um, you know, what people usually think about when they think about sustainability is like the definition from 50 years ago. It was when we were recycling and the EPA started and Earth Day and, and yes, and it's really evolved in the last 50 years, just as everything else has evolved, as technology has evolved, as us as humans has evolved. And so the definition now includes a lot more societal concerns and economic even. Um, and then ESG or environmental, social and governance is basically the metrics and, and KPIs part of sustainability. So if you think of sustainability as the definition of a healthy planet, healthy people, um, a healthy economy and community, and just kind of doing things now to protect that for the future. Um, and then the ESG piece is measuring how we do that. So that's kind of the difference between the two. But a lot of times folks use ESG and sustainability kind of interchangeably. So all of the things that are encompassed in sustainability ESG, it kind of is, is a bit much for a lot of folks to wrap their heads around. So the United Nations a few years ago actually developed 17 nice, neat, color-coded buckets to explain what ESG is and sustainability is in the world today um, and the issues that ESG is going to tackle and try to solve for. Things like ending poverty and hunger. Um, obviously, we've got solar and water and climate action, but we also have quality education, quality healthcare, um, and healthy cities and decent work. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. Um, even things like your data security and treating your customers' data, being good stewards with your customers' data. There's a lot of stuff that it falls into there that a lot of people just don't think about as sustainability, but it, it really is um, when you stop and really dig in to what it means. Um, so there you go. Nice, 17 nice buckets that you can really help folks to just put your brain around everything that falls under sustainability. So just as sustainability has evolved, business has evolved in the last 50 years as well. So for those of you who might have taken a few business courses at some point in your life, you probably remember in the 1970s, uh, there are two different individuals, Friedland and Mecklen, both came out with this theory that businesses should operate and all businesses' decisions should be made in a way that helps build the most shareholder value. Business owner values, show me the money, that's where the rules of Wall Street kind of came from. And, and so that was where things really started to shift and ramp up in the 1970s, where it was all about what is our stock price? How can we get that stock price higher? How can we get our top line and bottom line growth, you know, to grow faster? Um, and after a while, folks started realizing maybe that's not the best way to run a company. And they've started to really dig in and say, we need to take all stakeholders into account when making business decisions. So that's where you're starting to see the shareholder capitalism or shareholder view move to a all stakeholder capitalism or stakeholder view. Um, so that when you're making business decisions, you're taking into account not just what's gonna impact the bottom line, but how is this decision gonna impact my employees, my clients, my community, my local community that my business is located in? And then am I being a good steward with the resources um, that we're pulling from the planet with this decision? So a lot more stuff is coming into play. And when you stop and look at decisions and run a business from that scope, you actually run a more solid run business because you're, you're really looking at all of your risks um, when you're making your business decisions. So this is becoming more and more important because it is making this shift is really seeing, we're seeing uh, increased employee engagement. We're seeing better risk management. We're seeing an increase in innovation and creativity in these businesses that are running with this stakeholder capitalism model um, and improved long-term sustainability. So, you know, when you're, when you're 
making decisions from this place, you actually have, you're looking at your non-financial data in with your financial data and pairing the two together really helps you build a long-term forecast for your organization better than if you were just reading the financials, right? So that's where accounting is coming into play because all this new non-financial data that everyone is measuring, it makes sense to have accounting firms do this measurement because we're gonna be reporting this stuff out on financial documentation so that it really can be paired with the financial numbers so that it really helps make business decisions very easy for the owners. So business operations that benefit the bottom line, not just the bottom line, but the top line growth. Um, we're seeing that trend um, attracting B2B customers, B2C customers, um, do, running your company in, in a stakeholder manner um, really does help build the trust with not only your employees, but your customer base and helps build a stronger you know, community around your brand. It also helps you look at where to reduce cost because you're going to start looking at things like how much energy you're using, how much water are you using, what is your employee turnover, what, what do you, how much are shipping are you doing um, air versus ground, um, and it has you look at all these things, and once you start measuring something, it always improves. It's just kind of the, just a rule in general, right, of, in the universe, is if you start measuring something, it'll start to improve which if you start looking at your energy and waste and you start to think about, wow, here are some things I can do to reduce that, then one, you're not only being better for the planet because you've reduced your emissions and impact, but two, you're lowering your cost because you're not gonna have to pay for all that electricity or pay for that extra dumpster pickup. Um, and in, on average, it's about 50,000 dollars per employee, roughly, given which area you're in in the United States, um, when you have to replace an employee. So that's a real bottom line hit when you have an employee leave um, and you have to go search for a replacement, as a lot of people know right now. Um, and so trying to hold on to employees so you don't have to hire somebody, so you don't have to retrain um, and lose that continuity uh, within your business is really desirable. Um, regulatory and legal interventions, I will say that doing uh, an ESG framework like B Corp um, will help you look at your business. And also the reason I like B Corp is it's not only a framework that's free to access to anybody who wants to access it. It has, it's one of the few frameworks that also has a built-in review uh, and verification of the data, basically an audit. Um, and you have to redo your certification every three years. So it's not a one and done. You have to keep recertifying so that it really holds you accountable to those rigorous standards. So folks understand this about B Corp certification and understand that, you know, if you are making some claims on your website that you are better for the planet, that you're better for society, and you have that B Corp logo on your website, um, or on your product, um, they know that it's been reviewed, that you really are walking the talk. Um, and I know there's been a huge uptick in false advertising claims, um, particularly in greenwashing area. Um, and so it, I think a coffee company really just settled for $10 billion in a class action lawsuit for false advertising. And it, it's, it's huge. Um, that's not a, a small chunk of change at all. So really paying attention to, as you start this journey into sustainability ESG, that you authentically articulate where you are at in that journey so that you don't get clapbacks on social media um, and, and, and big lawsuits, because that is not what you want. You want to show that you really are walking the talk if you are generally doing this work. And if you're here, you probably are. <laughs> um, so some other things that are benefits will be productivity uplift, which when employees are happy, they work harder. They feel more motivated. They feel like they're, the business they're working for has a mission and purpose, which gives them 
mission and purpose in their work. So hugely valuable. It's a lot of um, individuals, particularly in, in the younger generation that's coming into the workforce, really make that a top priority. And when they go to look for a job, look for some place that is going to make them feel like they're contributing to society. So huge um, differentiator when you go out to hire and, and, and retain your talent. And then investment and asset optimization. Um, I will say companies right now are evaluating higher um, if they have gone through an ESG framework and, and have done that work um, because they've looked at a lot of the ESG frameworks, including B Corp, go through and look at areas in your organization you probably haven't looked at since you started um, and really helps you look at and eliminate risk first and foremost. And when a you know, an investor comes in and he says, okay, here are these two companies. Here's this company that has gone through B Corp and this one hasn't. The one that goes through B Corp is going to look more attractive because they've looked at all of their company risk through an ESG lens. The World Economic Forum actually has stated that the top five risks for any business are ESG related. So it really, it really behooves folks. If, if you're looking if, if selling your organization or, or even going IPO um, or even just getting into Sprouts or Whole Foods are, are desirable, um, definitely look at B Corp certification. So other frameworks, um, just to be fair, even though B Corp has my heart, um, <laughs> there are two different types of uh, ESG frameworks. There are frameworks that are more public facing um, consumer facing logos that folks are familiar with or becoming more familiar with, like B Corp, climate neutral certified, um, the sustainable development goals, and science based targets. I will say that the science based targets and the climate neutral are more focused on the E than the S and the G, where B Corp is very well rounded and it looks at the entire piece of the ESG. Um, and, and how it plays within your organization, which is another reason why I like B Corp. Um, investors and shareholders, they actually require more stripped down, just, just the facts, ma'am, um, type of reporting. Um, and for those, they look for SASB or TCFD or Impact IQ, um, or maybe you're trying to get into Nordstrom's and Nordstrom's uses, wants all of their vendors to go through a CDP or climate disclosure project report um, just to see what they score on that so they can basically list them appropriately within their stores because they really are trying to get more climate friendly um, partners in their stores. So um, Nordstrom's is even paying attention to this. <laughs> So what is B Corp certification? Oh, before we get going, um, there is a general poll question that just came through. Go ahead and take a quick minute. Um, what is the biggest challenge you anticipate in pursuing a B Corp certification for your organization? So is it a governance shift, which we'll talk about that in a second? Um, is it implementing the practices across your firm? Is it the actual demonstration of your social and environmental impact, or is it overcoming your financial and resource constraints. Um, and a lot of times people say one of the resource constraints is the, the B Corp uh, assessment, the impact assessment is quite rigorous and it does take quite a bit of time to complete and a lot of resources internally. So um, just being able to fill out the assessment and still do all your day job can kind of get a little, a little daunting for some folks which is why they you know, hire consultants to help them project manage that. So hopefully you've had a chance to answer that poll um, and we'll continue on. So what is a certified B Corp? Um, basically a certified B Corp is a company that runs under the B Corp goal, which is uh, basically kind of like Fair trade is to coffee or USDA is to milk. It's a third party stamp of approval that you're running your company with social and environmental performance that is high accountability and high transparency. Um, and they really do walk the talk, which is why they get that certification. 
And that goal is basically to use their business as a force for good. And that shows up in many different ways. So just because you may not have the advocacy piece that Ben and Jerry's has using their brand for adver advertising different social issues, or, you know, uh, maybe you have um, Tom's Shoes where they donate one pair for every pair that, they, that you buy, um, or Patagonia, which has done a lot in the fashion realm on sustainable um, fashion production and materials. Um, and they've shared with the rest of the fashion industry some of the stuff that they found saying, hey, we've, we've discovered this and this is better, you know, so uh, go use this instead. Um, and really building that into their business model. So there's a lot of different ways that your organization can do good. Um, and leverage your business and what you do every day to make the planet a better place. And that is the one goal that all B Corps have. They show up a little differently in how they do it, but they do do it. Now, why become a B Corp? One great differentiator. Um, I think right now we're roughly at 6,000, over 6,000, uh, maybe 6,700 uh, certified B Corps worldwide. Um, in about 160 some odd industries. Um, it's still very young, um, even though it's been around for quite a while. Um, it's really gaining speed and traction in, in particularly in the CPG brand world. Um, so there's still room for it to be a good differentiator um, and really showcase and set your brand apart from others. Um, besides the social buzz, besides the, um, you know, attracting investors and buyers, the hiring and retaining talent right now is, I know, one of the most important reasons our firm is a certified B Corp. Um, when we, when we typically go out and, and do a recruiting event, so in the accounting world, um, there is career day fairs where they literally pack 20 or 30 uh, accounting firms in a cafeteria on a college campus and um, open the doors and the students all come in and go around to the booths to find out what their options are. And I know when those doors first open that they all immediately go to the big four booths, Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, um, the big four. And the rest of the folks in the room kind of have to wait a hot minute, 15, 20 minutes, um, for, the, for them to trickle down into our booths. Um, I will say that the first time we put that B Corp logo on our recruiting booth, nice and big, really in your face, um, the students walked in the room, stopped in their tracks, and immediately was like, wow, there's a B Corp accounting firm? Because they're learning what this is in school. They're learning about conscious capitalism. They're learning about the different ESG frameworks in their business courses. So when they came in and saw that there was a B Corp accounting firm, they, we were just as busy in our booth as the big four, um, almost uh, basically to the point of at the end of the career fair, I had two different accounting firms come up and ask me, okay, so what is this B Corp thing and how do we get it? Because all the students were abuzz about this B Corp logo on your booth. And I have since certified several um, other accounting firms because a high tide raises all boats. So um, it's really exciting to see that students are understanding what this is and they're actually making a priority in their job search. So they're looking to work for certified B Corp companies. So big differentiator there. So who can become a B Corp? Any company that is for profit and has been in business for one full year, you'll need a full year's worth of metrics in order to answer all the questions. And that's pretty much it. Those are the rules. <laughs> so you can be public, you can be private, um, you can be any entity type anywhere in the world. This is a globally recognized certification, not just a US based or North America based, but a global community. Um, and it, it really does feel like a community. That was one thing that we, we knew we'd get quite a few benefits when we became a B Corp. But I know. Um, my managing partner, his favorite, his favorite benefit is collaborating with a community because it is so passionate and helpful and supportive. 
um, and B Corps love working with other B Corps. So, um, you know, generally we like to refer clients to other B Corp um, service providers because we know they're going to get, they're going to treat our clients like we treat our clients um, and that they're going to get the best service possible. So who can become a B Corp? Pretty much anybody. And even I have a lot of nonprofits that I work with that still use this structure, even though they themselves cannot take on certification, they still like the structure because it really does help them look at all of the things within their organization. Um, what does the current process entail? So keyword there, current process. So right now um, we are on version six of the, the B impact assessment or BIA. Um, and depending on what sector you're in, what business size, where you are in the globe, you'll get about 250 to 300 questions in the assessment. And some of them are multiple choice. Some of them won't give you any points because they are filtering questions. So this is the one thing that's really great about the, the B Impact Assessment is that it scales to what is material for your organization the best it can. Um, and so you'll have lots of questions in each of the sections, and we'll talk about the five sections in a moment, um, that will say, what's this, what's this, what's this, and then filter you this way or that way based on your answers. So there's going to be some questions that are worth zero points that you're going to answer that will help drop down other questions that do have points. And I will say that you need to upload documentation Anywhere where you garnish a point, you'll have to upload documentation in order to validate that particular point. Speaking of points, there are 200 points possible currently in the assessment, and you need at least 80 in order to submit for audit. I always like to say go for like 82, 83, um, just a buffer. You may lose a few points in the audit process, but B-Lab is really fair. If they see you're being hard on yourself in one area or see something that you didn't account for from going through your website and in their background check for your organization, they'll say, hey, what about this? Can we give you, let's give you points for this. They're completely fair that way. Um, but we always like to have a little buffer. You may go through and do the work for your assessment and get up to 95 or 120. So most companies though, when they go through and they do the first run through, that's what I always say, start with a run through, go through, look at the types of questions it asks, look at where it's asking for metrics and measurements that you might not be tracking right now so that you can get things into place to start to track it so that you can get a year's worth of that data in order to put that answer in the assessment. So it normally will take nine to 12 months for people to fill out the assessment because they're going back through and wanting to track some of the metrics that it's asking for that they don't currently track. So I will say go through and do a cursory gut check kind of conservative answer all the way through just to get a benchmark, a starting point. Many companies when they go through it's 40 to 60 points when they first start. Um, and then they're looking at like, how do, I, how do I close that gap? What are the actions I need to do or policies that I need to write um, and put into place? What, how can I make my company better based on the ideas that this assessment gives me? Um, and so that can kind of take nine to 12 months because you want to put things into process, not just to check a box, but to really get it into your company and, and working through and breathing through your organization. Um, and once again, you have to recertify every three years. So it, like I said, it's not just a one and done. It's not just, I need to brush my teeth and never have to brush them again. You do have to keep doing uh, the certification every three years um, in order to maintain your certification. So the five different areas, oh, we have another polling question. Which area of the B Corp certification is most challenging for your organization? Um, governance and transparency and accountability. You will have to show your financial statements to them unredacted. How do you feel about that? Are you a private company? Are you a family health company? That you might that might you know do a little bit of in you in you um, is it the environmental impact and sustainability practices? Maybe you're having trouble measuring your carbon footprint. Um, is it the social aspect and community engagement? Are you tracking your volunteer hours or having difficulties and challenges getting your employees to tell you what they volunteered? 
Um, or is that that scary supply chain piece, which supply chain shows up in the community section a lot? Um, and is it the supply chain and responsible sourcing? So really think about that and, and answer this polling question. Um, and I, I would love to see the results from this polling question. Um, so the five areas are in governance. How do you run your organization, right? What is the entity structure of your organization? Becoming a B Corp, you will have to do an entity shift if it's available in your state. Um, so if you're a C Corp, S Corp, you'll need to become a pub public benefit corporation. Um, if you're an LLC, you will need to shift to a benefit LLC. If it's available in your state, if it's not, um, there is a, there's a wonderful resource on the B Corp website that if you just type in B Corp legal requirements, this page will pop up and you can go in and figure out, okay, here's what entity status I am now. I'm a C Corp, S Corp, LLC partnership. And then here's the state that I'm in or country then state or territory. Um, and then it'll give you the exact what you need to do to make that legal shift. Um, and this is really important. Um, I like to I like to tell the story of um, Whole Foods and Amazon. So Whole Foods has um, back when they were in in talks with Amazon, they had that all uh, shareholders was in their governance documentation so that they had to do what was best, all business decisions were what was best for shareholders. And when the board was really not feeling good about having Amazon buy Whole Foods, um, that was like a real tense moment. If they had all stakeholders in their governance language, they would not have had to gone through with that particular buy because they could have told Amazon, this isn't good for all of our stakeholders. So that was, that was kind of a huge, that's I think a really nice example of the difference that language makes in your governing documents that you're legally held to. So in making this shift, you will legally be held to taking all stakeholders into account when making business decisions. So it's not to say that you can't ever make a, you know, one decision either way, it just gives you a little more wiggle room um, and, and to really live your mission for your business um, and in the most authentic and genuine way. So um, go to this page and type in um, what, you, what you are currently. It'll tell you what you want to shift to and if it's available in your state. Um, if not, it will give you the exact language that you'll need to embed in your governance documents so that you can get the most points. And I highly recommend, because I know sometimes it takes a little bit of a shift, um, a little bit of time to make this sh entity shift. If, um, you know, if you do it before you submit, you can get the points for it, which is a lot of points. It's like 10 points to make this shift. However, you can become a B Corp and, and get your certification, but you have a certain set of time to actually make this shift or you'll lose your certification if you don't make that designation shift. So I highly always recommend it. You have to do it before you um, push through. Now, there, that will change. I believe that the new standards are going to require people to do it before they submit. Um, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So governance, big one. Environment, how are you being good stewards with the, the resources you're taking from the environment? Are you calculating your water usage, your energy usage, your, your waste, your biodiversity, um, which biodiversity is going to be coming really big um, here in a bit because there's going to be uh, more global regulations put down, um, and, or I should say standards put down for biodiversity in business. Um, so that's an interesting one to keep an eye on. Then it's community. How do you treat your local community? Are you engaged? Um, your customers, do your customers like you? <laughs> um, and how do you engage with customers that are a part of the underserved population in, in the world? How, how do you engage with them? Um, and do, you know, what do you do in, in those moments? Um, and then workers, how do you treat your workers? What type of pay do you give them? Just minimum wage or is it a living wage? Um, 
pay gap analysis. You know, what is the difference between your, what you pay your CEO and what you pay your lowest paid worker? You know, what's the gap there? Um, so there's lots of different questions to look at that I know sometimes really um, bring up some really intense conversations internally for an organization. So I have a lot of people that uh, get this a little bit confused. So I want to make sure we've got B Corp certification and benefit corporation or benefit LLC. Um, they have a lot in common, which is why they're confusing. Um, but they have, you know, the similarities of both being um, leaders in the global movement to use business as a force for good. Um, and they meet higher standards for accountability and transparency. But Benefit Corporation or Benefit LLC is a legal type that is conferred by a state, um, you know, uh, California or Delaware or wherever. Um, B Corp certification is issued by B Lab, which is um, the organization that set the standards um, and, and it has no legislative framework. Um, B Corporation status is not available. Um, in uh, every state where B Corp certification is available worldwide. Um, and only certified B Corps actually have that audit and that recertification piece so that, um, you know, that there's that accountability piece that is so important um, in this work to be held accountable to these standards. Um, and then Benefit corporations or benefit LLCs do have a reporting requirement where they have to annually push their um, impact report out, benefit impact report, um, to their shareholders and on posted on their website publicly somewhere. However, currently there is not uh, a standard for it to be audited, so there's no one verifying that the information in those reports are is correct and true. Um, unless they are a certified B Corp and those metrics that they're push, publishing in that report have been reviewed and verified by B Lab um, for, their, for their accountability piece. So there are several fees that you will come across when you do B Corp certification. The first is a submission fee. Um, this is kind of a new thing, um, and they did this partially. I think because in 2020, I believe 50,000 companies alone opened assessments. And by the end of 2020, there were 6,000 companies in queue to be verified. Um, and B Lab is still, for most part, a tiny nonprofit. So the, the popularity has grown within B Corp community and um, what it means to become a B Corp. So they started, they put in place uh, a little, you know, a fee that basically is given a little skin in the game. So not everyone is just putting it, putting their uh, application through, that they're actually getting a little skin in the game, a little hesitation there, um, that they were not getting some tiger kickers. Um, so there's that. And I will say, before your submission, before you even start your assessment, think about the structure of your organization. Because if you're an organization that has multiple entities, under the brand that you were trying to um, certify, for instance, like a, a private equity group, or um, uh, maybe you are a construction real estate company that's got multiple buildings and, and whatnot entities um, in your structure, that's going to be a bit more complex. Also, if you are a business that's $1 billion in revenue or more, um, you'll need to go through a scoping process. And there's a little bit of a fee, once again, sliding scale. I don't have exactly what those fees are here, but you know, ask B Lab, they will tell you exactly what that fee will be. Um, and that is a good thing to go through because when you start going through, particularly if you have a complex structure of a bunch of different entities, to figure out what entities count in the employee count or your revenue or all the different things, all the different questions, you have to think about what, what is pertinent to this particular um, situation. For instance, um, you know, I have a real estate construction company that I'm working with 
and there's multiple entities, right? But those, some of those entities are really just, you know, uh, uh, a fund, not really, there's no employees tied to it. There's no like real transaction. It's just a, a holding something. Um, and so that, that doesn't really, it has the same name and it's an, a different entity, but does that count into, you know, all the scope of the full project? So going through and doing that scoping exercise with B Lab first is going to save you a ton of time and questions as you're filling out the BIA. And it is required for companies $1 billion or more because they want to get in there and they want to understand um, the organization at its fullest because organizations that are operating at that level, definitely some complexity there. So there's th like, there is a small fee for the scoping. Um, because it is work for their their people to do on their end. Now, annual fee. So once you become a certified B Corp, there will be an annual fee. And it's based off of the revenue on the day that you certify um, what that fee will be. As you can see, it's a sliding scale. Once again, very fair across the board. They're not going to make billion dollar companies um, pay what you know, million dollar companies are vice versa. Um, so it's based on the day you certify. And then that particular annual fee will be the fee that you pay for the next three years. Then when you recertify, whatever your revenue count then is, will be what you pay for the next three years. So there's, there is that. As you grow, your fee may grow. Um, but it will trigger on the revenue on your certification dates or recertification dates. Tips for using the assessment. So one, engage your whole team. It is going to take a small village to fill this sucker up. Um, like I said, 250 to 300 questions roughly. Um, it's going to look at every aspect of your business. So you're going to need to get your finance team involved, your marketing team, your HR, um, your operations group. Um, and maybe have a point person on each of those teams to come together and really talk about this um, and have them involved in the run through of the, you know, looking through the BIA. You're going to review the assessment together, come up with conservative answers. Don't take the time of like, okay, I need to go find what the exa exact answer is for this question. Um, just give it a rough estimate just so you can get a starting point. Then you can go in and start fleshing out the numbers and getting more exact and pulling documentation so that you can verify it. Um, so just get a, to get a baseline score. Then you're gonna start gathering all the documentation to say, okay, here's this, I, I generally say, get a spreadsheet together with all of your employees and you can list them by employee number, internal employee number instead of their names, um, what their wages are, what offices they work in, um, do they, take health care? Do they, um, uh, how many uh, days do they travel per year? What, what's their, their commute footprint? Um, are they remote? Are they in an office? Um, and so you can start spreadsheets like that, that you can upload for when you're answering all the questions that go to that. Um, then you're going to look at implementation and improvement goals. So when you're in the BIA, there's two little icons at the top, which you're going to look at in just a second, that you can use to help guide you and plan where you want to make improvements in the BIA so that you can increase your score, but also better your company. And you're just going to kind of go through this process of review and implement for a few rounds. It's kind of a wash and repeat until you get to that score, which you really feel comfortable with. It could be you know, 81, 82. It could be that you want to get over 100 and you want to do all the things. Great. I know a lot of my clients come to me and say, I want this to be the end goal, but I recognize that the journey of this process is going to be more valuable than the actual certification. So that's the right mindset to go in on this one. So once you actually do hit submit though, um, the request will go to B-Lab. You'll have um, an analyst assigned to you um, for a review stage. So the analyst from the review stage will go through and make sure all your documentation is correct, make sure you have all the things, Make sure that you've paid that submission fee, um, and they'll they'll do some initial just kind of crossing the eyes, crossing the t's and dotting the eyes, um, and then it will pass through to the verification analyst. So this is somebody who's going to do a deep dive 
into your BIA and start looking at a lot of the documentation that you've put in to make sure it really holds true. Um, and I do strongly advise that if you do the assessment, don't just answer the questions and submit it, put in the documentation because that's gonna save a ton of work for you in the long haul and it's gonna get you through the review and verification process a lot quicker because the documentation is all gonna be there. They're not gonna have to wait for you to pull all the documentation. Um, then once you're certified, you will um, sign your declaration of, of B Corp independence, declaration of independence. Um, and then if you have not made your legal shift by then, you will need to finish up that legal shift um, and then pay your annual fee to BLAB. Um, and that's, that's the rough gist of the process. Um, once you do get picked up right now, um, the queue is wide open. So if you do, if you are somebody who's ready to submit and you're like, mm, I've heard there's been a backlog on the queue, that backlog is gone. Go ahead and submit now. Um, and you will probably get a review analyst in like a week or two um, jumping in and going through your assessment. And I will say it probably takes a couple of months um, of going from review to verification just to get through all the documentation and, and everything to become certified. So it's definitely a long process, but well worth all of the work and the wait because you're making your company a stronger company. Um, and it's, it's definitely, you're gonna see it pay off in the end. So like I said, there's several key functions on each question in the BIA. So up in the corners, you've got a star and you've got a little bookmark flag. So the star is great because if you have a question that has say five different answers and you're really good with the first two, but you really need to work on the last three, push the star, it'll open up a goals page and you can select the, the additional answers that you would wish to answer in the future. Um, and then it allows you to pick one month, six months, three months. So how long it will take you to get that goal. And then it'll allow you to put in an email and be able to um, email reminders to yourself. So as you continue to work through this, you know, it's going to remind you, hey, here are the actions that you want to get done in the next three months or the next nine months. Um, and, and it'll keep you kind of on task as you go through. The bookmark tab. The bookmark tab is great for I don't have the answer to this and I need to look it up, but I need to remember to come back to this question. You can hit the bookmark tab or um, I need to book flag this because I think it's 25, but maybe it could be 35, um, you know, and I need to ask HR this question um, or uh, it's, it's so many different reasons. Um, and in the in the back end of the BIA, you can then go in and you don't have to go through each section again you can just go in and tell it to filter by all your bookmarks. So you can just get all your bookmarks. You can really focus in and look at what you're working on. So really great tools up there. And then this bottom box is the activity box. Ooh, okay, third question. What would be the most influential factor in the decision to pursue B Corp certification for your organization? So take a look at that and answer that. And as you're answering that, we'll dig into the activity box here. So the activity box, you can use it to put comments and notes to be lab about that particular question. You can use it for internal notes to yourself on how you got that answer. Because come three years later, you're not gonna remember what reports you pulled and how you, how you leveraged it to get the answer that you got. <laughs> Um, so it's great to put notes in there to yourself to help remind you how you got to that answer. Um, and you might not be the person in three years that has to go back and recertify. So it's a great way to put in your, your processes and procedures for pulling a lot of this data so that whomever is going through your recertification has that kind of step-by-step -step process. So I highly recommend that. This is also, if you click into this box, there will be a attachment icon where you can upload the documentation. This is where you upload the documentation to validate the answers within that question. Um, and you may have 
a link to a website to show that you have a list of ownership on your website, or it could be um, a copy of employee handbook um, or your financial statement or uh, your pg e records, uh, whatever it helps answer the question within that particular piece. Um, that's where you would upload the documentation. You may have three or four different types of documentation because some of these questions are really beefy. Um, and so it'll, it'll take a few different things to kind of showcase some examples, right? Some example job descriptions of uh, your employees that are actually responsible for a social and environmental piece. Um, maybe it is um, your whistleblower policy. You know, it could be all sorts of things. So the top five challenges that I've seen for people who want to become a B Corp. One, engaging your team or leadership. If you are not the CEO, if you are not uh, on the executive team, sometimes it can be difficult. Though I will say, if you cannot get the CEO or the top leadership buy-in for your organization, this may not work for you. Um, that is key to making this go forward, is to have buy-in from the top to really push this forward, um, because you're going to have to ask for lots of kind of sensitive documents to put into here. But I will say, the background on the B-Lab website, the, the BIA, uploading sensitive documentation, they have it really secure. So, and they are willing to sign NDAs for anybody who is uncomfortable with the information they are uploading. Um, I've gone through this several times with clients and it is completely safe. Um, it's about as safe as, as like uploading stuff to your bank. Um, so definitely that is, that is a huge uh, challenge, engaging your team and leadership. Because if you don't get the finance numbers or you don't get HR buy-in, it's kind of a big deal. Um, you know, there's whole sections um, that you're not going to be able to fill out if you cannot get buy-in. So engage them early and really, you know, really sell this. Um, if you are a CEO, awesome. I am so happy you're here uh, because you are going to drive that change within your organization. So finding time to complete the BIA, which is why it does take companies anywhere from nine to, nine to 12 months. Um, working with a consultant like myself, you can usually get through it in probably four to six. Um, it really does cut down the time because you're leveraging us to project manage, to help with standard templates that you can take and tweak to your organization. Um, and we understand the terminology and we understand some of the, the ambiguity around some of the questions to really help zero in and, and get the answers that are material for your organization. Um, completing the documentation requirements. So um, that could be having an employee handbook to upload because that's, that's normally where a lot of the policies for your employees are gonna reside. Um, it could be um, just your uncomfortableness sharing a financial statement. Um, because private companies, family held companies, they don't, they're not used to sharing that information outside of the organization. So um, there's going to be some, some inner like, mm, is this really okay? And it's okay. Um, there are, like I said, there are a lot, there's over 6,000 companies that have gone through the same thing. Meeting the legal requirements. So this is where um, should doing that shift from um, an S corp, C corp to a benefit corporation, for instance, um, it it can it can make legal counsel a little uneasy. Um, there's a lot of uh, our lawyer friends that are certified B corps themselves, um, and I highly recommend if you're going to do the legal shift to work with a lawyer um, uh, that is familiar with this entity shift. Um, there are a lot of lawyers that out there that are really great lawyers, but they don't understand this. And so it, it gives them a sense of pause and that just, it just drags out the whole process. Um, trying to, try to convince your lawyer that doing this is not going to be the end of your profitability because it's not, um, that's not the, that's not the, the intent of the verbiage. Um, so sometimes making that legal shift can be a little bit of a tricky process. So 
Um, talk to a consultant, talk to a, a legal team from a B Corp accounting, or excuse me, B Corp law firm. Um, they understand this designation a lot easier and it will make it so much less onerous going through that process. Um, and then becoming comfortable with a level of transparency um, because you are going to have to talk about a lot and disclose a lot of the things that you may not want to disclose. Um, but in doing so, it's making it's it's giving you an opportunity to be as transparent as possible with your community, with your employees. Um, there are things that they will ask. There's basically like a hidden sixth section on the BIA that is um, disclosures. So you'll go through and talk about um, any um, employee litigation, any uh, any bankruptcies. Um, uh, do you work with alcohol or um, uh, do you have alcohol companies that you work with as clients? So it, it's looking, there's several different controversial industries that it will have you go through um, to say, do are you part of this controversial, indus controversial industry or are you uh, have clients that you work with? If so, what percentage of revenue comes from, um, you know, for instance, we had to go back and look because we work in the wine and, and brewing industry with a lot of wineries and breweries. Um, and so we had to see exactly what percentage of our revenue comes from that industry. Um, and it was less than 1%. So um, we, um, if it was over, I think if it's over 1%, we would have to have disclosed. So just things like that. Improving your score. So once you go through and you're, you recognize, okay, we, we got some work to do here. You can really dig into a lot of the stuff I see where companies need to improve is just formalizing your policies and procedures. It lives in somebody's head and everybody understands what the policy and procedure is, but it's not really written down anywhere, which is why you would, you know, if you checked it, you wouldn't be able to upload anything because you can't upload our brains, right? Um, <laughs> so it, 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 take the time to really write down these policies and procedures. And that will help you eliminate risk in your organization, because if something it lives in somebody's head and it's not written down, that's a huge risk. Um, so things like a whistleblower policy or um, vacation policy or uh, just random things that are, it all goes in the employee handbooks, really. Um, but you just never have really written it down. Um, tracking metrics. Um, how many of you track? Um, your clients, and if they are women-owned, LGBTQ, um, veteran, um, the, all the metrics uh, or, or suppliers that you work with um, that really fall under uh, some of these underrepresented populations um, and, and tracking those metrics. Or maybe you do have those metrics, but you got to kind of pull a few different reports to get the distilled information. So um, begin to start to track what it's asking for. Um, and engaging with your suppliers and starting those conversations, which I will say, starting conversations with suppliers is a lot easier now than it ever has been. Um, so definitely get in there and start talking about, you know, a supplier code of conduct and if they adhere to it um, or who they work with, what their carbon footprinting is, because um, you'll need their numbers in order to do some of your numbers. Um, so there's lots of there, lots of conversations to be had with your supply chain. Um, and then carbon footprinting. This one is one of those one of those areas where a lot of a lot of businesses struggle because they don't know how to calculate this. That is where using something like a carbon neutral tool or um, going to like a Planet Ford or coming to a consultant, we can help you get through this these calculations fairly easily. Um, and, you know, help you come up with a reduction plan even fairly easily. Um, and then we can have the conversation around offsets and if offsets are right for you, or if you want to take your money and put it elsewhere to really help further your reduction plans. Um, but you're going to need this information soon because some of the first regulations that are coming down are for climate disclosures. So having your numbers will help you um, keep being within the supply chain of the public companies that are currently, they're going to be required to uh, disclose that information. 
So they're going to go down into their supply chain, which a lot of small to medium sized privately held organizations are within that supply chain. So have your numbers ready so that you can answer those questions when you're asked. Um, and then embedding your company's commitment, get through that, that entity shift before um, you hit submit. And that'll give you 10 points. So here's some of the some of the statistics. And I think it's, like I said, I think this is this is a little bit old. I think it's 6,700 something um, in 160 company uh, industries in 86 countries, all working under the one goal. So here's some of the brands you know. Um, and I do apologize, I am running a little bit long. Um, so if you do need to jump, I, I totally appreciate that. Um, and I do have a follow-up uh, article around the new standards that we can include in the thank you for attending email, um, which you're all gonna get copies of the recording um, and the slide deck so that you can go through this at your own pace. For those who can stay with me, thank you for hanging in there. Um, we're going to we're going to go through um, the B Corp changes um, and I'm going to get into I'm going to skip through to exactly what those changes are, um, because that's the most important part. They're going from five areas to 10 areas and the point value will change from 80 points overall to an exact point value in each of those 10 areas. So it's really going to hold folks um, to higher levels of accountability and transparency. Um, and it's really going to help um, some of the larger scale companies that are now undertaking this um, B Corp option to um, really not wiggle through the assessment as, as previous uh, public companies have. Um, they'll, they're, it's going to be more robust for even them um, to get through. So here are the new areas and some new stuff that you'll see is human rights. There's a whole DEI or um, JEDI section that includes justice. Um, there's more circularity and environmental stewardship. The circularity um, is a new piece, uh, human rights specifically, fair wages, um, and then risk standards. So they're really calling out the pieces that are more risk for the organization. Okay, here's my contact information. In case you have any questions, I will um, take a few questions now if there's anything in there. Um, as well as another shameless plug for my podcast, because I couldn't resist. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing. Um, there are a few questions. I'll go ahead and include them in the recording at this time. Uh, the first one I thought was very interesting um, is, what are some of the risks, if any, in holding off on certification, say, for a few years? Yeah, um, I will say, start with the work now. You can hit submit whenever you want to, but going in and looking at the framework and starting that work now. So I had one organization, one client that I worked with, where we actually started their BIA journey back in 2019. Um, and we didn't hit certification until oof, a few months ago, and they just certified um, because they were more interested in the journey of the process. And a lot of the work that they did in 2019 and early 2020 really helped them when COVID hit. And because it started their discussions with supply chain, because it started building uh, loyalty and engagement with their employees, they were able to survive COVID and keep their business running. So I think that's a really powerful, you know, antidote for um, doing the work and, 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 you know, it's going to make your organization stronger. It's not just about that stamp. It really is about the work in your organization that you're going to do going through the BIA process. So go through the process now, strengthen your organization now, sooner rather than later, because it's going to get you to think about all the, all the different things. Um, and then if you want to certify on the current version six, um, like I said, start now. Um, because we're a little unsure right now when the new standards are going to come out, probably in 24, um, maybe mid end of the year of 24. However, I know we know that they're probably going to do a phased approach um, for uh, the, the new standards. And we're not quite sure what that looks like because they're still, they're still pulling together what the exact questions are, what the exact point values are. Um, so it's still in flux right now. However, um, 
I will say getting in and doing certification now on this version of the assessment so that you do all of the five areas will help set you up when you need to recertify under the 10 areas because you've already put in the work. If you go straight to the 10 areas, that's going to be a lot more work. I, I, I foreshadow that. Um, I'm not, I don't know for certain yet because we haven't seen the final standards, but doing the work and, and getting in on the version six of this assessment is definitely a great way to start. And it will set you up for when we hit those new assessment rules. Thanks so much. Um, another question that was asked was, as a consultant, where would you recommend individual source information or stay up to date on B Corp standards or the community as a whole? Right. Great question. Um, you can go in to um, bcorporation.net, which is the B Corp website, um, and you can sign up for their newsletter. You don't have to be a B Corp to get the newsletter. Um, and they do a really great job of putting out webinars and listing things in that newsletter um, that you can stay in touch with, um, with what's going on in B-Lab. Um, also, uh, stay in touch with the Sensaba newsletter because we're doing the same thing. We're keeping folks informed on our end. As soon as we hear about stuff, we're, we're putting out articles. So, yeah. I did want to give about a minute or so in case anybody had any additional questions they'd like to drop in that Q&A tab. Um, if not, um, feel free to send them our way and we'll be sure to follow up with you afterwards. Okay, thank you for hanging in with me there, folks. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining.